Well, thank you and good morning from Australia. Um, what a wonderful conference we have had today. And my thanks to the organising committee for entrusting this session, retinoblastoma awareness and early diagnosis to me, my wonderful co-chair, Paula Dillon, also from Australia. Together with our panel of speakers, Isabella Mimo, who's a parent of Chloe, um, an RB survivor from Nairobi, Kenya. Ashwin Malapatna, paediatric ophthalmologist from Sick Kids Hospital, Toronto, Canada, via India and Australia. And Sydney Appleman, paediatric oncologist from Santa Marcellina Hospital, Sao Paulo, Brazil. I welcome you all to this session, which will reflect on the progress and success of awareness campaigns. The role of educating parents, healthcare workers, and where screening fits in. I will start by introducing Isabel, the mother of the lovely Chloe. I've been on the awareness soapbox for a long time now and have even been told it's too rare for awareness campaigns where I live. But Isabel's compelling story is a perfect example demonstrating that awareness campaigns in whatever form are worth the effort and do make a difference. Thank you, Isabel. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Isabel. Uh, I live in Nairobi, Kenya, uh, with my daughter, Chloe. Um, my retinoblastoma journey started one December afternoon, a sunny December afternoon in 2017, just before the Christmas holidays. Um, I was sitting in the living room with my daughter and she was playing in front of me and she was looking down at a toy and the sun was coming into the room at a certain angle. And I saw a translucent pupil in her left eye. Now we go back a few years um, to when I was living in the UK. Some years back while I was living in the UK, I read a newspaper article on retinoblastoma. The story was about a mother who was snapping images of her little son. And among the dozens of photos the proud mother had taken, one in particular stood out. It showed an image of her nine week, nine week old son lying on a playing mask, mat with a ghostly white reflection in his left eye. Alarm bells Ill immediately started ringing for the mother who had never seen anything like it before. After a trip to the GP, the little boy was swiftly referred to the local children's hospital where a consultant delivered the devastating news that a rare eye cancer had caused a large tumor behind his eye. That is a picture of Chloe. And uh, that is the glow that I saw in her left eye. And I must say that immediately I recognized this symptom because I remembered the article in the newspaper that I had read. And my first reaction was shock and disbelief because I knew exactly what it was. And there I was thinking, my daughter has cancer. And I went through a roller coaster of emotions, uh, both myself and my family. Mostly it was denial as we tried to reassure ourselves that nothing was wrong and that what we were seeing was just a shadow because every time we saw the translucent pupil, it was just for a few seconds and then it, it disappeared. And so we tried to convince ourselves that no, nothing is wrong with her. It's just something that we were seeing. And I remember uh, the bit of the article that said um, that um, the translucent um, pupil is, is also seen when you take a flash photograph. And what we tried to take a flash photograph of Chloe, but she was being very uncooperative. She was moving her head from side to side. So we just eventually gave up. But still that nagging feeling was behind me because I needed to know what this was. It was just before Christmas. So we were proceeding for our Christmas holidays in the coast, at the coast in Kenya. And I remember being very anxious 
hoping that the waiting for the holiday to, to get finished because I wanted to go back to Nairobi and get and immediately get an appointment with an ophthalmologist. So we managed, I managed to get an, an appointment with an ophthalmologist. Most of them were away at Christmas holidays. And I, through a friend, I managed to get to book an appointment and I took Chloe to see him. And the ophthalmologist using his various instruments for 45 minutes, about 45 minutes. And I remember really trying to hold myself from screaming. Uh, but he looked at Chloe's eye and he found nothing untoward. And he reassured me, I remember him looking at my eye and saying, it is definitely not cancer because he could not see any growth in her eye. He asked me to bring Chloe back in about a month's time to check whether there were any changes in her eye and in, in her vision. The second appointment was the same as the first one. He concluded he could not see any tumor. So he concluded that it is possible that Chloe has Coates disease which, is a, which he explained to me was an eye disorder characterized by abnormal de development of blood vessels behind the retina. He informed me that this could be corrected through laser surgery and he referred us to a arbitral retinal surgeon. I still had this nagging feeling that it could be more than just Coates syndrome. And you can imagine, I went to Google and read everything about Coates syndrome and also retinoblastoma. I managed to book an appointment with a surgeon and I booked Chloe for what I thought was just going to be a simple 45 minute procedure, laser surgery. She went into the theater and I sat. And I remember when the doctor came out about 20 minutes, I was thinking that was quick. So he called me into his office and that was when he broke the devastating news. He told me that Chloe um, had, had retinoblastoma and it was very advanced because the, her tumor was very large. And he told me that the only um, treatment that Chloe could receive in uh, Nairobi and Kenya and in Africa was um, an inoculation. And in my pain and my tears, I mentioned to him that I could organize to take Chloe to um, the UK for treatment. And he said, please urgently do it, get her there in the next month because she needs to be urgently seen and start under and treatment to be started. So in the meantime, I informed my friends and my family about the devastating news. And a lot of them were in disbelief because they were looking at Chloe and they were not seeing anything wrong with her eye. All they could see was two beautiful eyes with nothing wrong with them. Chloe was very active, she was happy, and they could not believe that this small child had cancer. And they were asking me, what did you see? How, do, how did you see, what do you see? And I was trying to explain to them and I was trying to make them catch that, that image, but they were not. And they were looking at me as if this lady is a bit, she's not, <laughs> there's something wrong with her. And I remember them asking me, so how did you know about this, 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 um, this condition? And I told them, look, I read it in a newspaper. And if I hadn't read it, then I wouldn't have known that this was ser as serious as, as it should be. After some, after um, organizing Chloe's um, documents, we um, went to um, we went to the UK, and she started her treatment. But in the meantime, I, was, I had been advised by friends, why don't you get a second opinion? Maybe the doctor is not speaking the truth because we can't see anything. Chloe is healthy and happy. And so I organized to see another doctor and he did a B scan on Chloe and he couldn't see the, the, the tumor. And he did another B scan himself and still he couldn't see the tumor. But he told me, look, if the doctor who saw her tumor during the EUA say that there is a tumor, then best to believe him, there is a tumor and she has cancer. So I actively pursued um, the option of going to the UK. Chloe was seen at uh, the Royal London Hospital once we arrived in, in London. And the team ha have been very, very supportive. Um, she has gone through quite a bit of treatment. She has had a total of six sessions of systemic um, chemotherapy. She has had seven sessions of interterial chemotherapy. She has had one session of radiotherapy. She has had 
a number of sessions of cryotherapy. And in January this year, Chloe was, um, the doctor found his, um, told us that she was, she got her first clear report. She got her second clear report in February this year. And because we were not able to travel to London because of COVID, we only managed to travel in June and she got another clear report. She is due for another um, EUA um, next month in November. But in the meantime, that is Chloe. She's a happy little girl and uh, she's thriving and she turns four in about 10 days. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. It was lovely to see pictures of Chloe with your story. Thank you. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Ashwin Malipatna. He's Assistant Professor in the University of Toronto and a staff ophthalmologist at the Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, Canada. Dr. Ashwin will be talking about red reflex screening and retinoblastoma. Thanks, Ashwin. So thank you for giving me this opportunity to present here. Uh, I'd like to talk to you all about red reflex screening and retinoblastoma. And I thank uh, everyone in this uh, panel. Uh, the story we heard so far is so uh, powerful, Isabel, that uh, I, I think uh, everybody should really know about these uh, white reflexes. And that's the power of the knowledge, of course. Uh, uh, you know, there are many ways to dissipate that knowledge. One of them is uh, a poster campaign and you can dance on the streets uh, sharing the news about it. You can run marathons sharing that as well. Uh, but another way to do this is to sc actively screen. And we don't know if uh, uh, we don't have as much evidence that the screening works for retinoblastoma as, it, as much as it works, as much as the posters work for it. But definitely red reflex cleaning can detect uh, eye abnormalities in a way that uh, we, we hope that retinoblastoma is one of those many eye abnorm abnormalities that uh, is detected by red reflex screening. Uh, traditionally, red reflex screening is done with an instrument that's called an ophthalmoscope. And it has been done so for about 150 years. So this has become the norm of practice. And uh, all through these 150 years, there was uh, 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 it, it was an easy enough test to perform. Therefore, it wasn't really, uh, we hadn't moved this test through the evidence that we really require nowadays for any new test to come out. So there's not really much evidence to say that this test works other than 150 years of experience. Uh, there are ways that uh, we're taught to perform these tests and uh, there are uh, uh, a few different ways. And most of those are prescribed in, in some of our textbooks and has been so for the last many years. So this is what a normal red reflex looks like. A normal red reflex is this red glow that comes out from each eye. The little white dots in the center is a reflection from the cornea, therefore not considered abnormal. Um, and that's, it's red like, it's red so because when a uh, flash of light reaches the eye, it reflects off the back of the eye and reflects back into the camera as red, reflecting whatever is red in the back of the eye, which is a normal retina right at the center in an area that's called the macula. And that is if they are staring straight at the camera that uh, th this uh, red reflex almost inevitably happens if you're in the right circumstance. Exploiting that reflex has been uh, uh, quite a task uh, for more, I think more than 15 years ago, the Tuka campaign uh, started to uh, encourage that we take a flash photograph of our children. And if we do see a white reflex from the eye, then that could be retinoblastoma. Shawnee et al in a paper described that uh, personal photographs could tell us when a, a cataract would start in an eye, when a developmental cataract would start in an eye and therefore detecting the exact onset of the cataract. The Alaskan Blind Child Discovery Program has used these red reflexes for a long time now to, to look at uh, these uh, reflexes and their abnormalities. And uh, they've come a long way and they use different instruments as of now. Uh, in Toronto, we devised something that was called the photo 
a red protocol, which was sort of instructions for a family that when if they follow these instructions to the T, then it, there's a good likelihood that they're supposed to get two red reflexes from the eye. And just to go over this very briefly, we dim the lights in the room. We have a child facing the camera with eyes open, which is not as easy as it's written over here. And uh, we have a compact digital camera that's with a built-in arc flash and not an LED flash. And when the flash is on and the anti-red eye is off, when the camera's in program mode, and when you have about a four meter distance with most cameras, then you get a red reflex. Not all red reflexes are equal. Adults with light eyes give you different red reflex from, different red reflexes from adult with dark eyes. The darker your irises, it seems like the, uh, the, the red reflex is darker as well. Children give you a different kind of reflex as well. And it also matters where you look. If you're looking at the camera, at something nearby or off uh, axis to the distance or maybe uh, off axis distance at, at uh, sorry, off axis to some object that's close to you. But uh, the most reproducible reflexes were obtained when, the, when you were looking at the camera and at a certain distance that's more than four meters uh, using a specific camera. And the reason for that is not only the color of the eye that these colors stay different, it's also the angle, which is the flash to lens angle and the pupil size that matter. And all of this will allow us to uh, um, predict with each of these cameras what distance you have to be away from an eye to give you a red reflex. So if you have a camera that's like this, which is a compact camera, which, which Sandra had actually sent me an email about recently, you would need to be about uh, three and a half, more than three and a half meters about, or about 12 feet away from uh, the camera. There are many abnormalities that can happen despite that protocol. You can have a pseudo absent reflex, as you can see in my wonderful wife right here in the center. Uh, it's not really absent over here, but that's how dark Indian red reflexes can be sometimes. And the pseudo white reflex, as you can see in my 10 day old son here, this was seven years ago, uh, because he's looking at the wrong spot. And we knew he didn't have a retinoblastoma in the eye because I, I was a pediatric ophthalmologist who knew that information. Pseudo white reflexes can occur for many reasons. When you're looking uh, slightly away or off axis, when there are refractive errors in the eye, when the camera is not good enough and the camera sensor detects bright reflexes as just white. This is an example of a video that shows you uh, white reflexes in many parts in this for various reasons, either because the optic disc, which is the uh, uh, nerve that leaves the eye to reach the brain is reflected back or because they're looking off axis in a further distance away. So uh, can the photo red protocol be accurately used as a screening method? It can detect normal eyes pretty well. It can detect obvious abnormalities re really well, but it couldn't detect very subtle abnormalities in red reflexes as well as a direct ophthalmoscope could. We pushed this to a limit uh, and we, and we uh, took this out onto the road literally and figuratively in India. Um, and uh, we, we went on to test this in a way that uh, if anybody failed a certain test that was called an infrared photo screening test, then they went on to take a photograph of the eye and the photograph of the eye was with the red reflex protocol. And uh, then we examined those with only an abnormality. And if they came out as abnormal, then we'd label them as having some trouble that required them to come to a hospital. Uh, there are other technologies that do this right now. Infrared photo screeners is what I showed you in the last uh, slide, but there are other technologies now that's called an arc light of thermoscope or cat cam, peak retina. But what we do know from a good study that was published from work in uh, Africa is that a pen torch or a flashlight will not give you the same information as any of these red reflex tests do. And therefore, we would not like to suggest that in any eye examination for a child. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ashwin, for your informative and compelling presentation about um, the red reflex. It is an important test and used in the right way, we know that it can make 
a significant difference to diagnosis. I'd now like to introduce Paula Dillon from sunny Brisbane, Australia. Paula is the mother of Grace, a vibrant and active 16 year old bilateral retinoblastoma survivor whom I had the privilege of looking after many years ago. Paula is also a registered midwife with a Master of Midwifery who will share with us her experience of perinatal loss, not only as a mother, but as a midwife and educator. In developing strategies to raise awareness of retinoblastoma, we can look to the experiences of others for guidance and advice on what works, what doesn't and why. But importantly, we must stay the course and know that in doing so, we can affect change. Thank you, Paula. Thanks, Sandra. So I'll be talking today about raising awareness and empowering parents. So we're reflecting on some strategies to improve outcomes. These are my first two children. Grace on the left was diagnosed with bilateral retinoblastoma at the age of five months in April 2004 in Melbourne, Australia. Whilst getting ready for my brother's wedding, we noticed her left eye didn't look right. The pupil looked almost translucent and photos taken at the wedding with our brand new digital camera showed a white reflection in that eye. I had a friend that at the time had her four-year-old had recently been diagnosed with bilateral cataract. So I thought maybe she had bilateral cataracts and we'll go and get that looked at. An optometrist and subsequent ophthalmologist appointment several days later, followed by an EUA, confirmed four tumours in Grace's left eye and three smaller tumours in her right eye. Bilateral retinoblastoma, a condition I'd never heard of. My bonny breastfed baby has cancer. Will she die? Was the first question on my lip. Fast forward 16 years. And here she is in this photo. No, she most certainly did not die. Chemotherapy, cryotherapy, radiotherapy, and finally, a nucleation of Grace's left eye when she was 27 months of age equaled no more cancer. Grace is now finishing her second last year of high school. She has won numerous academic awards. She has a strong social conscience and feminist ideals. She loves to row and go to the gym, So play piano, cards, puzzles, and board games. She has a boyfriend. She's learning to drive. She has aspirations of a career as a physiotherapist or maybe a sports doctor or a financial journalist. But our daughter did die. Our second daughter, Annabelle. Annabelle, here on the right, was born on 21st of May, 2005, one week past her due date weighing 3,780 grams or eight pound five. Annabelle was stillborn. The cause of her death was a massive fetal maternal hemorrhage. She hemorrhaged via the placenta into my bloodstream. Undetectable, untreatable, unpreventable. After Annabelle's death, I became involved in education about stillbirth, initially to student midwives and then to other healthcare professionals. And over the last 15 years, I've also helped develop information brochures about fetal movement, been involved about um, in education programs about stillbirth prevention, and also care of families who have experienced the devastating death of a baby. And I've also been in working groups to develop guidelines for clinicians and parents. The goals of all these exercises is to improve care for families who've experienced miscarriage, stillbirth, or neonatal death. Another goal being to raise awareness of stillbirth, especially reduced fetal movements in pregnancy, being a risk factor for stillbirth. Now the challenge with awareness raising campaigns is that awareness for awareness sake does not necessarily improve outcomes. What has the potential to improve outcomes is the education that goes with the awareness campaign. And we've seen awareness campaigns work and work well. I'm sure many of you will know about the safe, infant safe sleeping campaign of the early 1990s, always place baby on their back to sleep, aim to reduce the incidence of sudden infant death syndrome or SIDS. It worked. 
since the introduction of the Back to Sleep campaign by a nationally recognised organisation called SIDS and Kids, now called Red Nose. The SIDS incidents in Australia dropped by 85% and in the US it dropped by about 50%. In Australia, that equates to almost 10,000 babies' lives saved as a result of Red Nose's safe sleep campaigns. The marked reduction in the incidence of babies dying suddenly and unexpectedly can be directly associated with Red Nose's Australia's public health campaign which promoted the safe sleeping practices, particularly advice given to parents to sleep their baby on their back. This message has spread globally and you can see here some infant safe sleeping information from around the world. I volunteer for an Australian not-for-profit organisation called Still Aware, whose mission is to end preventable stillbirth through awareness and education. One of the main Still Aware campaigns is raising awareness about the importance of a mother getting to know her baby's movements in utero and to notify her healthcare professional if she notices a change in her baby's movements, as a reduction in baby movements can be a sign that baby is not doing so well. This also has worked in other countries. A study in Norway in 2009 showed that uniform information about monitoring fetal movements given to a sample of pregnant women resulted in a reduction of stillbirth rates in that population. And a more recent Dutch study in 2019 looked at whether the use of new information brochure for pregnant women on fetal movements results in less patient delay in contacting their maternity care provider, thus potentially saving precious time and lives. These are two examples of studies around taboo topics, such as stillbirth and fetal death. And these topics remain uncomfortable for many people to discuss, as does cancer, particularly childhood cancer. But we've definitely come a long way in the last 10 to 20 years. With regards to retinoblastoma, an education campaign needs to be initially directed at healthcare professionals, such as family doctors or paediatricians, and also new and expectant parents, and then to the general public. We often hear the lack of awareness and knowledge is on part of the doctor rather than the parent. You've already heard from Isabel, um, the importance of parents' input, parents' intuition. Something wasn't right. I thought something was wrong and I wasn't listened to. I wasn't heard. I was perhaps dismissed by the doctor. Perhaps the doctor doesn't know about retinoblastoma or perhaps they assume it is too rare for them to ever see. If healthcare providers are educated, they can then listen to parents when parents suspect that something isn't quite right. Having said that, if parents are aware, aren't aware, they won't go to the doctor in the first place. Robertson and colleagues in 2008 looked at using information to promote healthy behaviours and found that campaigns with clearly defined target groups have been found to be more effective. For example, universal mass media campaigns aimed at reducing alcohol usage had little impact, but those that targeted specific groups, so for example, pregnant women, were more effective in changing attitudes. We often assume how others will react to negative topics such as stillbirth or miscarriage, infant death or childhood cancer. However, if presented with evidence-based information, it's often not as anxiety inducing as one might anticipate. It's empowerment for parents rather than anxiety. There is information about retinoblastoma out there and you can see this on my slide here. Let's draw from other proven campaigns, such as the Back to Sleep campaign or the Fetal Movements Awareness campaign and develop a retinoblastoma awareness campaign so that parents know that retinoblastoma exists and that it is entirely treatable and curable, especially if picked up as soon as possible. Other presentations during this session will briefly discuss the challenges faced with raising awareness of retinoblastoma the role of parents' intuition and public and clinician awareness campaigns and how early detection can minimise side effects and potentially save eyesight and lives. 
I live in a developed country. We thankfully picked up Grace's retinoblastoma at the right time and we saw a healthcare provider who listened and followed their suspicions, which then allowed us to follow a proven treatment regime that saved Grace's eyesight in one eye. Had I received evidence-based information during my second pregnancy about the significance of decreased fetal movements, and from that information, had I then acted upon my baby's movements, or sadly lack thereof, perhaps Annabelle would be alive today. Awareness and education work. Thank you. Wow. Paula, thank you for your wonderful presentation. You highlight important parallels between the taboo about perinatal, about talking about perinatal loss and childhood cancer as barriers to developing awareness campaigns, as well as wonderful examples of parent education in action and how that can certainly affect outcomes. I'm sure we will be able to draw on your experience and expertise to develop strategies to raise awareness going forward. Thanks, Sandra. So I'm going to introduce Sandra now, who <laughs> whom I met 16 years ago, or actually, yes, nearly closer to 17 years ago um, in Melbourne. Now, Dr. Sandra Staffieri, I'm sure many of you know Sandra's beautiful face, has been a clinical orthoptist for more than 35 years. She's currently the retinoblastoma care coordinator of the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne. And Sandra's research has focused on raising awareness of early signs of retinoblastoma, treatment outcomes, survivorship surveillance, and the translation of genetic testing for familial, familial or heritable retinoblastoma. Thanks, Sandra. There is no simple or single solution to raising awareness for retinoblastoma. And I think we all realize and know that a multifaceted approach is required. There are many examples around the world of strategies that are specifically tailored to each country's needs. This afternoon, um, well, this morning for me, this, uh, I would like to share with you the centerpiece of my PhD. But before I start, I would like to acknowledge the peak medical research funding body in Australia, the NHMRC or National Health and Medical Research Council for funding my research. Because when they did, finally I realized that someone else thought early diagnosis of retinoblastoma was important. Now with any disease, we rely on signs or symptoms or sometimes both that raise a red flag. Adults can notice and respond to these signs and symptoms themselves, but children need to rely on someone else to recognize them. Now it's obvious in these three images that the lump on the eye in the left image and the swollen eye or the droopy eye in the right image um, are not normal. And these problems, they look obvious, they attract attention and importantly, they'll prompt action. Unlike the early signs of retinoblastoma, a white pupil seen on the right and a wandering or turned eye seen on the left, they are silent and often otherwise asymptomatic. The child is well and does not behave as if they cannot see until both eyes are severely affected. If you didn't know that either a white pupil or a turned eye may be a sign of something serious, you may just let it go. Now this parent's statement from the last 1RB World Meeting really resonated with me. We would have remembered to look for this sign if we had been educated about it. But do we educate parents? And if we did, would it work? Well, I think if we make the effort to educate parents, we can make a difference. Paula highlighted many examples where education improved health outcomes in children, but for retinoblastoma specifically, we can look to a simple awareness campaign initiated 10 years ago in Honduras. Before the campaign, the majority of children presented only once retinoblastoma had developed into extraocular disease, so it was outside of the eye. And consequently, the child then had a very low survival rate. Posters as shown on the right were displayed in community centers where parents presented with their child for immunization. Together with educating health workers, within 18 months of the campaign commencing, the number of children presenting with disease outside the eye reduced by half from 73% to 35%, and importantly, their survival more than tripled 
from a low 14% to 48%. And remembering Isabel's story earlier, we also know that a simple newspaper article can and does make a difference. But there have been many newspaper and magazine stories in print and online, examples of which are shown here. And let's not forget social media or digital platforms which allow us to share information widely and frequently at minimal or low cost. Now this can be very helpful to keep parents alert to the signs of white pupils and eye turns, but I think retinoblastoma is actually too important to hope a parent comes across information incidentally. As highlighted in this parent comment, I've never heard about a white pupil, you'd think you would if it was important, made me realise this could be part of the problem. In my state at least, parents are not given any information at all about signs of eye disease in children. Indeed, it was after my attendance at the very first 1RB World Meeting in 2012, I went on my mission to produce that information. For my PhD, first I conducted focus groups to understand what parents did and didn't know about white eyes and turned white pupils and turned eyes. Their comments about seeing these signs did not surprise me, but rather confirmed what I already knew, that they would not necessarily be concerned if they saw a white pupil or an eye turn in the baby. Such as an example, it's very easy to think that you could be that it could just be the lighting or the camera. If you don't know, you don't know. Then, using all the information from my focus groups and interviews, I designed an information for parents describing normal eye and vision development in children, what to look for and how to respond if worried. A theoretical framework for behaviour change supported each component of the pamphlet, whereby I provided information, messages to motivate action and advice on what to do. And once I had the pamphlet, which is shown on the left, I wanted to know, would people who received my pamphlet, if they were faced with a hypothetical situation, be more concerned about white pupils and eye turns? And importantly, would they be prompted to see a doctor sooner? So using a fancy randomized control trial, I enrolled pregnant women in an antenatal clinic waiting room to participate in my study. Unfortunately, time does not permit for me to explain exactly how I did the trial, but basically the women with or without their partner completed a survey that included hypothetical scenarios accompanied by photos about what they would do if they noticed a white pupil or a turned eye in their child. They were then randomly assigned to receive either my pamphlet or a control pamphlet, which was about playing with your baby. Two weeks later, they completed the same survey so I could measure whether there was any change in how concerned they would be as well as their hypothetical help-seeking behaviour when faced with the same scenarios. Briefly, the study showed that women who received the pamphlet did in fact report being more concerned when they saw the image of a child with a white pupil, seen here on the left, and were also more likely to seek advice sooner. When they saw the eye turn shown on the right, however, they were no more concerned. And maybe that's because eye turns as a condition are more familiar to us, but, they were more likely to seek advice sooner. Nothing else predicted their changed responses, just whether they received the pamphlet or not. Yes, that was an awful lot of effort to go through to show that if you give people information, they will be more informed and make different decisions based on that new knowledge. Now I had the evidence. The next challenge was to meet with the policymakers so that all parents could receive the information when their baby was born. That was easier said than done. However, my main messages to the stakeholders were number one, children's eye health information was too important for parents to stumble upon social media or the newspaper, although they are great platforms for reinforcing a health message. And number two, even though my motivation was early diagnosis of RB, the information would help detect many eye diseases in children earlier, not just RB. I wanted to put awareness about RB on the shoulders of all paediatric eye disease, as I had been told many times that RB was too rare to care. The process of dealing with policymakers has been long and tedious, 17 months and counting actually. 
In between the unanswered emails, I came upon an app, an image of which is shown here, that was the centerpiece of the Department of Health's initiative to provide parents with infant health information. But I found their Achilles heel. You see, just like Google, you can ask the app any question. So of course I did. Who would have thought searching for white pupil in photo would come up with, sorry, I don't know how to answer that yet, or worse, information about the color of baby poo. Let's just say when I pointed this out to them, I had their attention and now they are listening. The app is now working better and they have even included a link to the web page at my institution that contains the information from my pamphlet and research. I am still fighting to have relevant and important health information like my pamphlet provided to parents systematically, which remains a work in progress. More research on what difference this makes will be critical for it to be sustainable. But maybe there is hope that with education, there will be earlier diagnosis. I leave you with the wise words of Mahatma Gandhi. First, they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then you win. Thank you. So uh, our final speaker is um, Sydney Eppelman, the paediatric oncologist from Brazil with a long history in association with developing retinoblastoma awareness strategies in his local country. We have known for a long time that lack of awareness of the early signs of retinoblastoma contributes to delayed diagnosis. In Brazil, there has been significant activity for many years now, and Sydney will share with us his experience and importantly, the progress that has been made. Thank you, Sydney. Thank you, all of you, for including me and including our country and problems that probably is sharing for other developing countries, which is very difficult, even after working 30 years with that, and we started the first campaign already 20 years ago, we still have a lot of problems. And I, I think it's very important to have webinars and discussions like, like today. It's very, very interesting to hear. There's some, still some problems that are for, for all of us. Very briefly, uh, coming from a developing world, so I have to, sh I have to share that the campaign is important, but all the problems, even when you have the diagnosis of children with cancer, you have to think. I, of course, I don't have time to go through most, but just to remind that all the problems are important. Even when you have the diagnosis, then what to do, where to, to refer a patients. And also, uh, it's very important to know that most of our children still have, even after the diagnosis, through a campaign or education or pro procedure or process, uh, they have difficulties of access. And that's a big problem that I want to share with you. And because of that, and not only access for treatment, but appropriate comprehensive, comprehensive center that can give the, the, the right treatment and then the patient have the, the advantage of having a, a saving procedure, for instance, that's available in the country, but not in our entire country. So it was well, uh, Sean, and I, I, I keep repeating that medical education care for physicians uh, are, are very important and we need to do that constantly. It's, it's, a, it's a regular process. And educating parents that's already shown, very well shown is part of our campaign. And uh, we also worked for new legislation and some, some time for old re, re, le, re, legislation like uh, how to have the, the studies and uh, the procedures done regularly in children, even a newborn and even after in a regular consultation of pediatrician. And as I said, access for accurate diagnosis and state of the treatment is mandatory when we work in a retinoblastoma program. I'm not gonna go through that because if you have the access, if you have the campaign, if you have early diagnosis, you also have to, to give all this, all this point, all these important strategies that are important to give a, a, a good treatment. But unfortunately, we still see patients like that. If I've worked in there for so many years, with all campaign, we still, that's a child that came for the refer to us in May 2014, we started working with the early diagnosis campaign in 2001. So that's, a, that's something that we need to keep going and keep going and, and doing more and more because unfortunately, and that was a child that unfortunately, even we had access 
of our center, we couldn't do the best for this patient, unfortunately. So we, we had more patients uh, with uh, extraocular disease. We still have patients with extraocular disease. We still see patients with the first sign and I know the long lag time. Uh, in Brazil, we have 400 new cases a year. And as we, we, we know, better treatment is not the solution. We have to have early diagnosis. And that started 20 years ago when you did a lot of, most of you know about our campaign. We have started discussing with the government, translation, our video form was available for more than 40 countries in 13 uh, languages. We still can, can, can provide that if somebody is interested. Uh, and those are the, the languages we still have because photograph is still a way to have a, 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 a diagnosis and call and as education process for our parents. This is still important campaign, but I'll show you other, other uh, strategies. So we can, you can have those, that we, I put the address below with this campaign that you can have by YouTube, it's available for free. And, uh, uh, and the poster, uh, we use in the in the beginning and it's used to do a lot of work now with the with the seller with all the medias we can have much more multiply much more this kind of posters for for many parts of the country and much more less expensive than in the in the beginning it's very hard to know how many patients were uh, diagnosed through the campaign because most people don't uh, allow us or don't uh, report us that was the diagnosis and we are not on the only center we have in the country so in the first report that we had many years ago we knew that it was important not only for the diagnosis of the, of the retinoblastoma but also for for the diagnosis of other diseases so that's the importance of educational process and co-attention that something is going on wrong in the eye of a child and we we believe, and that's, that's what is, is shown, that that's a part of a campaign for prevention of blind, blindness in childhood. That's a very interesting story because these patients, they have the diagnosis, not an early diagnosis, but through the campaign, he had diagnosis. That was, he lived for 15 days by boat from the capital of Amazon. Then they took the plane for, for more four hours to Sao Paulo, where our, is our center, and that was a big story. But at least he had diagnosis, lay diagnosis, but through the campaign he had access of diagnosis and treatment. That's also very important in in in, in communities and in countries like ours. And uh, ten years later, in two thousand, I will show you easily in this uh, timeline. We have the first campaign, two thousand one, two thousand eleven. We had uh, it was important to open a. Retinoblastoma Comprehensive Center in our uh, environment, in our hospital. And we could had give access for free for all patients. And that included intrauterial chemotherapy. We, we, were, we are able to provide all kinds of treatment for those patients that come to our center. So that was a part of the strategy because not only some patients had diagnosis, but they didn't have access for the treatment. So in 2011, we opened that because it was was very important strategy. And then the, the, the next year we had, we, 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 we were the president of Brazil at that time, signed a decret to transform September 18th, the day of awareness day and incentive for early diagnosis in Brazil. That was a day of awareness, a day that we do a lot of uh, 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 alternatives, like uh, I'll show you one of them, uh, because we can raise awareness if you have one day, we can increase understanding of the solution that exists, translate knowledge into actions. And, and that's what I'm going to say, generate a movement that stimulates collective responsibility and action. And uh, through that, we were, for instance, we all of the world know that Cristo Redentor, the Corcovado is our Christ, the Redeemer in Rio de Janeiro is our, one of our symbols. So instead of giving pink color like for breast, uh, uh, ma for breast awareness or prostate, we decide to do something different and then we switch the light for 15 minutes to show that what can happen if the patient have laid their nose. 
that's called the attention of the media, of the, 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 the television and so on. But not only this monument, we have in many other cities in Brazil, uh, some important monuments that at the same time, we turn off or switch off the lights in order to call attention for, the, for that day. And I invite all of you to, to, to be part of us and maybe we can make a, a world movement of switching off some monuments around the world to call attention for that, uh, for that disease. And also we have all the campaigns that are available in, our, in this address in YouTube. It's free for, please feel free to, to see what we can develop to call attention. And uh, as I said, it's important to have also access for, for Brazil, for all the developing countries, free access for diagnosis, but also for treatment. Otherwise, the patient have the diagnosis and don't have the, the transition to quickly for a center that can provide good treatment. Next steps, I will not go through all of them, but my, my point that's very important in this webinar is that we have to keep going with the educational process and campaign for already they know because that's the, the way to go and uh, we cannot stop. That's a yearly go around to uh, have uh, that and stimulate all these issues uh, and all these signs and all this knowledge for, as mo uh, for most of the people we can reach. Thank you very much. Well, thank you everyone for a wonderful panel. Um, we have some questions from the audience. I know we're a little bit late on time, but I'm hoping we can get through a few of these before we proceed with our closing remarks. Uh, so the first question um, that I'd like to pose to the panelists asks if you recommend any of the apps that are available for red reflex screening. Um, I don't mind taking that question if that's okay. Um, I. I uh... I like the technology of apps and I really know I'm, I'm, I'm watching it with a great interest. Uh, I do know that each of these apps are limited by the phone that they have, that they're connected to. And uh, some of these phones have worrying technology in them to suppress red reflexes in different ways. Uh, so I'm not too sure if uh, it's a good red reflex screening app, but I do know that some of the apps detect leukocoria, which is a white reflex. And maybe the apps will be successful in doing that more than a red reflex because the phone uh, groups seem to be suppressing uh, a lot of the red reflexes uh, uh, that uh, I was looking at even recent phone technologies were doing the same as well. So uh, I'm concerned about that. Thank you. Um, there was another question asking there was an observation from a member of the audience that we hear quite often about left eyes being enucleated. And there was a query as to whether this was a coincidence or if there was data to support a higher likelihood of a left eye being enucleated. Can I take that as well and say that it was a coincidence? Great, thank you. Um, another question is for uh, Sydney. We are wondering how you recruit governing bodies to your awareness campaigns so that you have that recognition. Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> it's a lot of pressure. Then you can also show that it's possible. Then you can have to go to, to Brasilia and then you call deputies and then the press and then you have to call people, important people. So it's a lot of, you know, it's not impossible. That's, I would say that's not the most difficult. And because they don't spend, they don't spend spend too much money with that, they, are, they, they, they do this, this law, especially the day. For the legislation that we have for routinely fundoscopy in some cities, that's much, much a little bit more difficult, but you can get some um, deputy federal or state deputy that some, somehow uh, put as a law, uh, but a lot of pressure. I think it's a, a saving eyes in a child is a good, uh, is a good uh, <laughs> a way to call attention for those kind of people, politicians sometimes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Surely. Thank you for that. Um, one of the audience members was reflecting on COVID and the pandemic we're all experiencing and wanted to reflect how campaigns were able to continue for retinal blastoma in light of um, COVID and, and uh, different limitations that that might pose on things. If anyone wants to take that question. I can take. Uh, it's interesting. For three months, we start having 
pandemic and all the all the bad things happening from March, from March to uh, the number of patients decreased a lot. But in September now we had a campaign when we were able to keep going with all the, the process and so on. So uh, we try to keep going with everything in the country uh, as much as possible, even with the difficulties to travel sometimes for the patients to come some. But uh, the, 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 the process of education the campaign we, we, we kept as much as possible. And last September, we, we were successful in our awareness day, if I can say that. What about you, Sandra? Have you, has your campaign at all been effective? Well, that's an interesting question because we don't have a campaign. So, um, hmm. but as a, as a, um, as a treating center um, that, uh, communicates very regularly and very frequently with the other treatment centres in Australia, remembering that Australia is a very large country. It's as big as the US, but we've got a very small population. You know, I, you know, listening to Sydney and, and their 400 cases a year, I preside over maybe four. Mm -hmm. And um, that is our biggest barrier to get um, awareness campaigns because the numbers just aren't there. And I'm being, this is where that it's too rare comes from. Yeah. And um, because of that, with COVID, it was like the last thing anybody was worried about. But as a team, we were concerned that parents were not going to see their doctor. And interesting, interestingly, just as we came out of our first little lockdown, we had two patients diagnose, present within a week of each other. And a similar experience um, was had um, by our colleagues in Queensland, as well as in New South Wales. I'm hearing similar experiences around the world that there's been this little lull and then it's, it's ramped up again. Um, and it'll be very interesting to look at the firm data that will get published about this. Um, but we haven't done anything specific because we can't even get a campaign run at the, at at the best of times, let alone during COVID. Right. Thank you for that answer. Um, we'll just take a couple more questions, if that's okay. Um, another question for Sydney, wanting to know if you could comment on some of the factors that might explain why there is still such late diagnosis uh, for some in Brazil. It's very easy. Very easy. <laughs> I, I said something during my talk. Uh, even sometimes the patient have the diagnosis through not so late sometimes, but there is the, the second point to late diagnose. It's access, as I said. The patient comes from Manaus or from northeastern part of the country. Brazil is a country of contrast. What happened in Sao Paulo did not necessarily happen four hours by plane in the northern part or the northeastern part of, of the country. That I can explain even with the COVID. The results in Sao Paulo, in the state of Sao Paulo, the 35 million people, uh, it's not the same in Amazon because you don't have from one day to the other a, a center to get patients with a retroblastoma and treat properly. So as I said, we have to do the campaign in developing countries, but we also have to provide centers. Otherwise, you have the diagnose and you, you, they don't get the, the access for treatment. So you have the delay after the diagnose, which is at the end of the story is the same point. So. Uh, the main the main reason sometimes somebody suspected had a diagnosis, but the le the time between that diagnosis and treatment is also a delay. Had also a delay. Yes, thank you for clarifying that very important point. Um, one last question that I think Ashwin you volunteered to answer. Somebody was asking if uh, red reflex screening has been added as part of normal pediatric routine in a developing country. That's an interesting question, um, and it's always based on which country you come from. So, uh, not too sure uh, which country they're referring to, but it's it's an important point to make that uh, uh, red reflex screening, even in developed nations, is mandated mostly only at birth, and not afterwards. And maybe sometimes afterwards in some countries, but not always followed up in those countries as well. So uh, I would say that uh, red reflex cleaning at birth might pick up those large tumors that are present maybe at birth, but might not pick, pick up the really small ones that might grow to be a tumor later. 
Uh, so uh, um, I think I'm answering the question in a different way, saying that uh, maybe red reflex screening is uh, important in more than just once. We haven't decided when the second time or third time should be, but I would say red reflex screening is important every time they pre any mother presents with a white reflex in your clinic. So I would think uh, uh, that is the that's the message that should go out. And I really think every other uh, um, thing that's been di discussed here, such as the important messages from Tuka, the posters that Sandra spoke about, the stories that Isabel tells and uh, Paula tells as well. I think those are very important in spreading this uh, uh, knowledge of white reflexes, but really getting the red reflex timing correct is something that we're still getting better at. Can I add something? Absolutely. I, I think you are absolutely right. It's not just it's just to say that, and that comes back to the screening. As you said, you know, the screening is something that should discuss because uh, the routine is something that doesn't happen everywhere. Even it's by law, it's not done properly you you have shown that nicely but then come back to the discussion about screening which is to come back and have a discussion that it's it's really a procedure that should be discussed in some countries especially in developing countries to have early diagnosis that's a good a good subject to come back and discuss not now of course but uh, uh, it's quite interesting well thank you um to all of the panelists in this really great engaging session it was such a treat to hear from all of you and to hear, of course, the lived uh, parent experience is such uh, a privilege for us. So thank you all very much.